So, <clears throat> yeah. Okay, so um, this first presentation is really going to like uh, draw a big picture about uh, what's happening in the timber sector in mostly French-speaking African countries. So uh, what I'm going to say in the first part is really applying to Côte d'Ivoire, Cameroon, Gabon, DRC, Congo, uh, CAR. Um, there might be some similarities also with English-speaking countries, but I'm less familiar with them. So Liberia, Ghana, Nigeria, um, also maybe Equatorial Guinea, I'm less certain that this is really applicable to those countries. But yeah, just to, to mention, like it's, it's, um, it's mostly directed at French-speaking countries. Um, so we're going to see that the forest governance setup um, is quite similar for all those countries. So there's main basic features, but also the evolutions that those countries went through are similar. So I'm going to go through them. Uh, I'm going to talk about the main timber illegality risks that are also very common for all those countries. Uh, not much difference there in terms of risks um, and where they come from. And then Caroline is going to join and we're going to have a small picture about what's happening in Cameroon and, and Gabon more specifically. It's going to be a less focus about the illegality risks, more about what's the specificities of, of the country. So that's the plan. So yeah, I'll start with saying again, like there's, there's an overall very similar forest governance setup uh, across Western Central Africa. Uh, of course, there's a legacy of colonization. I mean, uh, France and Belgium mostly have been there in a big, big area. So especially for France, uh, the area that France colonizes now several countries, and, but you can still feel in the, the way forest sector is, um, is managed that there's this, uh, this legacy um, still, still there. But other than that, the, even after the independences, the evolutions uh, were quite similar in those countries, and I'm going to go through that. So the similarities not only linked to, to this period of time. Practical differences can be found in those countries. They will be um, mostly linked to geography. So the forest cover, um, is there a stronger or less strong demographic and agricultural pressure? Um, what's the weight of the economic, what's the economic weight of the timber sector? Some countries have more access to other natural resources or other sources of uh, income. For some other countries, timber is like a, a bigger share of the economy. Um, the size of the country is also playing a bit of a role in how things, uh, how things are uh, set up. Size of forest unit can also matter. I know that in Cameroon the forest units are smaller than the RC, for instance. Access to export routes and infrastructure can also play a role. And, uh, and finally, yeah, vocabulary is just a way to say that uh, you can find different names for similar things across those countries. So it's just something you need to expect. Um, that's just a small picture just to highlight how, uh, how the laws can be extremely similar between countries. So that's just an extract in French uh, of the DRC first code, the current one, and the Côte d'Ivoire current first code. And you can see that it's uh, extremely, like the phrasing and the sentences there like almost identical. So that's just a like, funny way to highlight how you can really find um, similar phrasing, similar sentences, similar setup uh, across those countries. Okay, so <clears throat> I'm gonna start with the main elements of the forest governance systems in, uh, in those French speaking African countries. Um, of course, all I'm going to say is quite like it's it's quite rough. It's quite schematized. There's details and like it's quite interesting topic. So uh, there's more to it, but uh, I'm going to talk about the main ideas. So for instance, if I really go back to land tenure systems in general, so the way people use land, um, that's not specific to forest, but to the whole territory. Um, it's quite important to keep in mind that there's kind of a cohabitation between two uh, very different conception of uh, land use and land tenure um, systems in place before the colonizations um, are still there today and they're mostly so that's what we call customary rights um, or like it's it's non-written rights first and it's rights that are like it's rights allocating the use of lands and resources that's more focused on usage um, 
by individuals or by groups of individuals um, and they can overlap uh, geographically um, and it does include uh, giving collective rights to a specific group of individuals. Colonization brought European concepts of private property which is mostly like more linked to really ownership of the land. Um, it's focused on having one individual or one uh, clear, clearly defined moral entities being the owner of a specifically um, delimited area of a specific delimited area. So it's, mo it's most it's a it's a conception of land owner that's most mostly focused on having an area that's delimited and saying who's who's it belongs to. So it's less focused on what do you, what can you do on this area. It's most focused, mostly focused on where is this area and uh, and who who does it belong to. And it's important for the forest uh, system to keep in mind that those two conceptions kind of coexist in all those countries. And so what's formally written in the law might not be the big picture of uh, land uh, access rights and, um, and land tenure. And sometimes this cohabitation is a bit weird and contradictory and uh, we're having trouble when we, when we look at uh, access to land. Uh, we're having sometimes a lot of trouble figuring out who's right and what's the legality there because the written uh, law is not the whole thing. But um, that gave um, a really high focus on administrative delimitation that dates back to this uh, period of colonization. So, <clears throat> sorry, I'm just having things popped up on my, on my screen. So, um, on all those countries, there's the high focus on mapping the whole territory and formality regulating land use throughout the territory. So that gave uh, something like that gave a clear division between um, what's supposed to be a permanent forested area in the country and the rest of the land, which is often called like non-permanent forest areas or domaine residuel in French. So there's there's this clear mapping of what's supposed to be and stay a forest and the rest of it, which might biologically be a forest, but that could be a land dedicated to other usage. So there's this kind of clear mapping and um, and it's it's usually consisting in mapping separate forest units, like individual forest units throughout the country. Uh, you see here that's the map of Ivory Coast, so you can clearly see the, the green parts are the forest and national parks, and then the rest of it is the domaine non permanent. So it's not supposed to stay a forest, but you can still find trees in them. And on the contrary, you can have a, a, an administrative forest, and when you go on site, it's just agricultural uh, um, land. So there's this kind of distinction in those countries, uh, which is a bit weird, but there's this administrative definition and delimitation of forests that's not totally the same as the biological definition of a forest. Um, <clears throat> that also led to a high monopoly of state on forests. By default, um, the land and forest are, let to, are left to state ownership. That's the conception of terra nullius or terre sans maître. So the idea was that as long as there's no formal registration of a land, and everything that's not formally owned by an individual is left to the community, so to everyone basically, so to the state. So that's why uh, we have in all those countries a really high, um, a really high concentration of forest within the state's hand, and it's called uh, forêt domaniale. So it's really saying that it's the state estate, like the, the state has a kind of a private, uh, yeah, private rights on all those lands. And over time. <clears throat> There's been uh, the development of uh, incorporation procedures, which which is uh, what is called classement in all those countries. So classement means that it's the formal procedures for incorporating a, a piece of land into the state domain, state estate, and that's why uh, the management of forests is historically highly uh, centralized uh, in the hand of the states. Up until the 1990s. Uh, there was a simple forest exploitation quite similar to mining exploitation. So the system was like the state was awarding logging permits to company with specific volumes. They would just come and take the timber and, and go away. Um, the logs, it was mainly about getting logs and exporting them outside, especially to Europe. 
um, there was high timber demand from World War II, which also fueled this, this whole system that went on until, until the 1990s. At that point, um, so it's not too old, it's quite recent, this, this whole idea of forest management and managing a forest, it's only 30 years old. Um, at that time, the concession model was introduced um, in the wake of all the discussion about sustainability. And so the system of um, forest managing and, and logging tends a little bit and focus more on the long-term involvement of private entities, which the idea was that they would be allowed to log a specific big area in exchange of being involved in uh, implementing forest management activities. So there's kind of this dual thing, like they have the right to log, but they have a duty to conduct management activities in the forest. And to do that, uh, the main system was the concession system. So basically the state has uh, the rights over the forest and it will just um, delegate and give some rights over this area to a private company through a contract, right? So it's kind of a private agreement between a state and a private entity. Um, and so this entity would sign a, a concession agreement um, normally, and normally it has like technical specification attached to it, so un cahier de charge. That's what it is. It's the specifications to the contract between the state and a private entity to manage a forest. So it's quite interesting because you have a layer of legal requirements on forest, that's the law, but you also have contractual requirements between the state and a private entity. <coughs> Do tell me if I'm speaking too fast. <laughs> However, so even if um, there was this introduction of concession uh, and that really got quite important, in most of the time there's a continuity of uh, simple logging authorization which are still there and still available. They're usually more focused in non-permanent forest areas um, and they're more likely to be standalone harvest permits. So one to three years a company will have uh, specific volumes to harvest in a very it's in a much smaller zone uh, area right and the example is Van de Coupe in Cameroon and we'll get back a bit more in detail but that's that might ring a, a bell um, to what this is there is kind of a weird setup in Ivory Coast um, in this country the non-permanent forest area is divided into big chunks which are given, granted in the long term to private companies. So it's a bit of a mix between concession, um, the concession system, but in practice, there's like, there's no management of those areas. They try to, uh, to include that, but it's, uh, it's quite recent and it's not working well. So it's a bit of a specific thing to Kudiva. And finally, um, the legal frameworks also usually include rules on clear cut to, uh, to really change the use of the land. So, deboisement or, and rules linked to bois de conversion. Uh, usually, there's a specific, um, a specific regulation applying to those, uh, to those specific things where you'd want to transform the land into agricultural land or industrial uh, land, etc. Taxes and fees uh, usually work based on volumes. So the more you harvest, the more your fee will be um, high. For concession, there is also a system based on the surface. So the bigger the concession, uh, the bigger will be your annual payment, right? So there's usually a fee per um, uh, per hectare, and then you will uh, you will just multiply and based on on the surface of the concession holder, and that will give. Um, the surface fee. There usually also is a system of bank deposits uh, for concession holders, uh, so uh, they usually need to deposit a certain amount to be able to access the concession just in case they cannot pay at a later stage their taxes. And finally, um, in most uh, countries there's also possible graduation depending on the sourcing area, the idea be being that the further you are from the export point um, and, uh, and trade routes, uh, the uh, lower the fee will be. So it's kind of a compensation for being very remote in very remote area, because uh, that's quite costly to uh, move timber around. And also certification. Uh, so in some cases, you can see that fees can decrease with uh, the certification status of the forest. <clears throat> 
Uh, I'm not an expert. Maybe Caroline can, if you have questions on that, can expand a little bit in the Q&A session. Okay, so that's the big picture. Um, if we dive into what has been introduced with the wave of uh, requirements on sustainable forest management, I'm going to say a few things that are, again, quite common, um, very common to all those countries. So you usually have a system with kind of a layers of management documents. Uh, the requirements usually are that uh, a forest management unit that's, um, that's likely to be um, in this, under the system of concession will need a longer term management plan. So it's usually 20 to 30 years and it's applying to the whole forest. This bigger plan will be declined in medium term planning. So it's usually five year planning and it will apply to a smaller portion of the forest. So the portion uh, to which you will uh, conduct operation uh, within those five years. And in turn, this five-year medium-term planning will be declined in uh, an annual operational planning, again, into a, a more restricted, restricted area, uh, the area to which you will conduct management activity for the year being. And that's usually called Programme Annuel d'Operation or Programme Annuel d'Activité. But the name can slightly change across country. So <clears throat> despite the changes of names, um, the principle is the same across those countries. And it's important to keep in mind that those <clears throat> documents are really management documents. So they will include information on logging, where you can log, how you can log, the species you can log. But they will also, um, they will also have other kind of prescriptions. Uh, it can be about if, you, if you're going to do assisted regeneration in the forest, if you're going to have to work on infrastructures, bridges, roads, um, if you're going to do surveillance against poaching or encroachment, if you're going to do some fauna monitoring in the forest, it can also be what you're going to do um, about socioeconomic um, local developments, how you're going to work with communities. So it's really like the, the whole manage all the activities that are around the forest would be detailed in those, uh, in those management documents. In general, over time, the regulations really um, got more complex about first, what are the steps and studies you need to undertake during the drafting process of those management documents? So the regulating frameworks can be very specific on what you're going to do about inventorying, um, is that a, a verb? I don't know, about doing inventories of the forest resources, of the biodiversity, also the social aspects. And in some countries, you even have specific templates you need to use uh, to do that, right? So, um, so the first thing is like um, there can be a focus on what are the steps someone needs to undertake to do to draft a management plan. Um, the approval process also got heavily um, more and more, let's say, more and more regulated. So that means that the regulations and the law increasingly detailed. Uh, if the forest administration will do some verifications about, let's say, the forest inventories, how they're going to control that and how they're going to approve um, the resulting forest management plan and forest management documents. So most of the time, uh, a, ma a forest management plan that is submitted by um, the concession holder needs to be formally approved by, let's say, either a decree or regulation. Um, and here you can see a screenshot that's just a letter. So I hope this is a valid document that I put in there. But anyway, there's kind of a formal way of approval saying like, okay, this first management plan is approved and it's also applicable uh, to uh, plan gestion, so five years management programs and then annual operational planning. <clears throat> so very quickly, um, that's another important thing. Uh, this first management planning um, has an objective of attributing objectives to different forest areas. They are called usually seri, and they can overlap with the annual uh, and, and five-year areas of operation, right? So within an annual uh, area of operation, you might find um, different seri, so different areas, um, which is a bit tricky, but that's, that's worth mentioning, I think. So you usually have a bigger part of the forest, which is the production forest, so that's where you, you, you'll be able to log. But uh, you usually have things like recreation city areas, that's a bit rare, but protection conservation areas are more common. 
uh, and that you can also find uh, social economic development um, areas, which is in pink, I think, in this little example. And, uh, and as you can see, those are areas around uh, human settlements um, and, and research that, that's also quite rare. And as you can see, protection series, are, you, can, you can guess on the map that it's mainly following uh, river bodies here. Uh, it can kind of show, and the orange parts, so conservation areas, usually that's that's where there's an important um, animal uh, group that's that's endangered or that you want to protect. That's like the most usual thing. Um, <clears throat> very quickly again, because it can get quite complex, but that's why I, I put this, this screenshot, because so the objective of this management planning is basically to allow forest regeneration before the next logging. That's why there's a really important focus on forest inventories that can be declined. Like, so management inventories will usually be very light. It's like what, around 1% of the forest and it's usually um, what, what is used to, to draw this picture of the forest and, and have a broad idea about the different uh, areas of the forest and how you want to use them. But then you, you normally have exploitation inventories or inventaire uh, d'exploitation so within the annual within your annual um, area you'll do a complete inventory um, and that's like so it's, it's much more detail and that will uh, that should uh, give you um, specific data on how much you can take keeping in mind that basically so the way annual units are, are split up is that there's there's the period of rotation that's decided for the forest so it's usually the length of the management plan so it can be 25 years let's say and so based on that the forest is divided into 25 annual units and the idea is that you will take in your annual units only what can regrow in 25 years the catch is to know that it's quite difficult and that's that's why like there's there's really really technical studies uh, involved in in this management planning and the 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 math the math be behind those is, is quite complicated as you can see in the screenshot so i'm not going to get into detail but just so you have this idea that um <laughs> planning how the forest will regrow is quite a complex uh, matter and and that's what's used during forest inventory to actually know how much you can take in in one annual area without damaging the forest so that's about the forest management uh, broad uh, principles in addition to those management documents which are as i said not only focused on logging um, concession holders will usually need an annual administrative authorization specifically for logging. So that's usually called autorisation d'exploitation or permis annuel d'opération. Again, it can have a slightly different name, but the idea is the same. And when you see the documents, they indeed do look alike. Um, they would usually contain information about which species you can log and which volumes you can log, which volume is allowed to log. That's based, as I say, on the uh, inventaire d'exploitation conducted in this annual area. Uh, you can also have, as we can see here, information if there's a specific restriction on volume, um, sorry, diameters. And in Ivory Coast, it's quite interesting, you even have uh, a specific list of trees, so trees that are individually uh, designated for logging, um, which is not the case in, in other countries. You usually have a broad volumes and then operators will go in the forest and they can uh, pick the trees they want, but not in Ivory Coast. Um, a few other elements that that's a bit less uh, problematic, but that's that's important to know. Usually, forest management enterprises need to have uh, an accreditation, which is called an agrément à la profession forestière. That's quite common. It's quite administrative, so I don't think there's a lot of risks attached to that uh, specific thing. Um, and they, they usually will have specific markings for them so they can apply to trees and, and logs and uh, yeah and stumps, sorry. Um, it's called Marteau Forestier um, and it's usually a triangle with three letters that are specific to one company uh, that, so that it can be identified at a later stage. So again, that's, that's a bit, uh, that's important to know, but uh, not too problematic. So, <laughs> As a conclusion, that's, that's a few points on the 
general challenges faced in this country is about forest management process throughout um, forest management units. It's still an ongoing process, right? It's been it's been 30 years that this concept was introduced, but um, updating the legal frameworks took some time, and then getting people um, involved in, in doing it also takes some time. There's, there's a debate on who is supposed to finance all that, because uh, doing the studies, conducting the studies, doing the math about the forest regeneration and stuff like that, it takes time and effort. Um, and who's going to implement, actually, those uh, management activities, especially when they're not specifically connected to logging. Um, so usually how it goes, like most of the time, is that uh, a forest concession will be attributed to a private operator that will be tasked with drafting the forest management plan. Uh, the, he, this entity will usually have a delay to do that. It's usually around three years. Um, it can usually conduct some form of restricted logging during those three years. Um, and after those three years, the forest management plan is supposed to be approved and then the concession is managed and the private concession holder is implementing the forest management plan. So that, there will be small differences around countries uh, in that. And I know especially like who's supposed to do the management planning um, can slightly change, but that's, that's the general trend uh, of how things are conducted. In general, we've seen quite a, a big, like uh, a high level of state tolerance to forest management entities uh, not respecting their deadline for forest management planning, despite specific regulation saying otherwise. So that's that's a one thing. Um, in the forest management document, sometimes the division of responsibility between state and private companies are not always, always very clear. I've seen management plan in Ivory Coast where, um, for instance, for surveillance activities, it's really not clear in the forest management plan who is actually tasked with enforcing those activities and financing them. Um, there's a question also around the quality of management documents. Uh, this process is highly costly, it takes a lot of time. Sometimes the quality is not up to the task, um, but then is it is it illegal? Maybe not. So there's, um, there's this, this um, specific point. And yes, in general, it's, um, that's, that's an, a debate for <laughs> like that can last longer, but it's important to raise the question about not enforcing something that's said in the management plan is it like what's in the management plan is it legally binding or is it more general guidance uh, and there's uh, interesting debates around that sometimes the way it's formulated is uh, can be really debated sometimes it's it's more formulated as a guidance there's a lot of debate specifically around the rotation uh, succession so usually management plan will say that this uh, annual area is supposed to go after this one, is supposed to go after this one. And it's quite common that this order will change and the question will be, is it legal or illegal? Um, so that's, that's quite an interesting uh, point to raise when we are talking about legality. Um, so before talking about legality risk, I'm just going to touch based on uh, a few other evolutions. So other than the introduction of sustainable management, um, of uh, around forests. So, um, so in general, legal frameworks, including more and more um, rules about how to attribute concession to private entities. So there's more and more rules in those legal frameworks about introducing open bidding. So a more transparent and open process of allocating uh, forest units. And so usually it's like this process of an open bidding, which uh, contestant will have to provide the financial and technical submissions and the idea being like that the state will need to choose the most profitable company and not the one that's friend with uh, the minister or whatever. So um, so there's an increase and a push for more transparency in the attribution. In some country in DLC the framework is like the legal framework is extremely detailed. It's, it's saying like how much points who needs like the committee needs to attribute for this at that moment. It's very very detailed. It's not been applied so far, uh, as far as I know, because there's a moratorium on uh, attributing concession. So it's a bit of a black box. So <clears throat> I have not seen a lot of open, like truly transparent open bidding process yet, but it's uh, increasingly in regulations. 
um, transformation has also evolved a lot. Um, there's in general a big push to increase transformation locally. As I said before, a lot of like most of the uh, logging was just ex exported uh, as logs, uh, so there was no transformation whatsoever in the country. Um, now there's, there's a higher level of either encouragement or requirements uh, for concession holders to install a mill locally. So you'll be given a concession, you'll need to do a management plan, but you also need to invest in a mill to do the first transformation. And that's the case in Cameroon and Congo, these absolute requirements. And the other side of the, the coin, let's say, is also increasing restrictions and prohibition to export logs. Uh, and that's quite also common. All those countries will have at least some form of restriction to export log, if not an absolute prohibition. Uh, I think Ivory Coast is completely prohibiting log export. Um, yeah, and Congo has recently changed the way uh, of the phrasing of what they allow and what they don't allow to be exported as log. But yeah. anyway, not going into the detail, but that's, that's something that's uh, kind of already there always there. Sorry. Um, there's been a shift also on the inclusion of local and indigenous communities um, deriving from the concepts of benefit sharing, uh, free prior and informed consent, but also co-management, community management, etc. So those are all theoretical concepts that got translated somehow in the regulatory framework. Um, the first thing is the rules to incorporate land into the state, classement, um, got, um, yeah, got updated, let's say, and, and now the most recent uh, the legal frameworks and regulations do include more rules on information or consultation or even consent from communities to, to incorporate uh, some piece of land into a state estate. It's a bit late because in all those countries, there's like a high number of areas which are already incorporated into the state. So the state's not going back to those, uh, to how this, these lands have been incorporated in the past. So uh, again, I, 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 the regulatory framework has evolved, but I've not seen it applied uh, much. And, um, and yeah, and so that's, that's highlighting, so there, there might still be existing tension between land that has been incorporated into a state estate and communities which disagree so um, on the basis of their customary rights and so there's again this tension between what the law formally says and what's written black and white and other kind of rights that might be unwritten and that might uh, clash with what's what's the formal uh, system in place which is tricky when you apply ETR and you're supposed to look at the legality and we have this really like written conception of, of legality. Um, local and indigenous communities also got involved, uh, of more like um, included in the relations uh, between the private concession holders and themselves. So requirements also got um, introduced around that to and clearly shifted um, a system attributing simple usage rights to community to a more active role. So informing them, including them in the management planning process is the first thing that's usually required. Um, but also concession holders, like after all the management planning process, they're also supposed to uh, get into bilateral agreements between themselves and local communities. And that's usually called clause sociale du cahier des charges or cahier des charges contractuelles. The way it works is that it's bilateral agreements with the concession holder and the community that's attached to the technical specification that's annexed to the contract between the state and the concession holder. That's kind of like the weird setup, but um, but yeah, essentially it's, it's a bilateral agreement. And those bilateral agreements, the objective is to more clearly define rights of local communities in, in the forests. Um, can be about like so duties of local communities something concession holder insist on <laughs> most of the time because they're worried about encroachment for agricultural activities or poaching etc um, but it's also about identifying cultural and spiritual values to protect in the forest to so make sure that you don't log a sacred tree um, and also and mostly how to foster local development so that's 
deriving from this benefit sharing concept. Um, so how to, to foster local development. Um, so there will be rules on local employment from the concession holder, but also providing uh, direct uh, or indirect financial and technical participations. Uh, so it can be uh, building infrastru needed infrastructures or contributing to, to projects. And there's also this, uh, this concept of having local funds for local communities to spend however they want. So again, usually it's directed at infrastructures and projects and you can see set up with local committees to do the follow-up and to do the spending, etc. Not going to go into details because it's quite complex, but that's usually what you can find around the inclusion of local communities. Um, <clears throat> taxes and funds in general have been uh, what the regulatory framework have tried to redirect uh, some part of taxes and funds directly at local at lo the local level, so it, it doesn't go through the state and then doesn't trickle down to the local community. So that's that's been a, an effort and a trend. Um, there's also the a, a quite uh, important increase in the concept of community forests. So regulatory frameworks have uh, created this concept quite recently. So um, so the idea is that the community has always managed his its territory properly, so it can still keep doing that, and there can be a formal way of, of uh, attributing a forest to a community, and and it's resting on customary rights but in practice however it's most of the time legally it's more like a concession from the state to a community so it's again a bit of a complicated setup um, but uh, yeah that's what it is so basically the state will enter into an agreement with the community on the basis of the community providing elements that it has customary rights over a forest um, this concept is more has been more applied and more developed in uh, in, in practice in, in some countries, so specifically Cameroon and DRC, um, and community forests usually will have a, a form of simplified management. Uh, so they'll have, they'll have a shorter management plan that uh, that can be applied and they can log their forests. And last but not least, um, there is sometimes an increase in rules specifically for indigenous people. So let's say forest dependent people like people who really live in the forest and live from the forests um and there's there's not a lot of example congo has recently developed um specific regulation for indigenous people but the impact in practice is very low and for instance for cameroon there's nothing in the regulation that differentiate local communities to forest dependent communities at all so that's a few words on that i have two more slides about this shared evolution uh, in the Congo Basin and, and West Africa. Um, domestic logging was uh, also increasingly regulated uh, in the last years. Um, the concession system is mainly directed at exporting timber, right? But local populations do have uh, a need for timber and that, that demand is increasing. And that kind of fuels the importance of illegal logging because the the concession are not usually accessible to um, to local head entity which do not have the the access to proper investment so that they can access concessions so concession system is usually like there was a lot of french and italian companies in the past um, nowadays there's there's more uh, there's more asian companies getting involved into concession and there's also local slash Lebanese companies uh, getting involved in, in the concession uh, system, in, in forest concessions. But there's quite a few um, um, national, let's say purely national um, enterprises that can get involved into the concession system. So that's why the local need for timber really is kind of was fueling illegal logging. And so there's been a push, like an effort to actually regulate more um, efficiently small-scale logging directed at domestic needs and that's why all the forest uh, regulations usually include spe like a specific category which is artisanal logging um, and they usually make a distinction between very small uh, so that's at the family level or village level that's very very small permits like sometimes it's like five trees 
and medium enterprise, which which are kind of in between, right? They're not operating at the level of a concession, but they're still um, they're still enterprises, uh, and usually they will sell timber uh, throughout a, a whole region of the country or throughout the country. <clears throat> a few final evolutions. So, um, private forest implementation have been increasingly included in legal frameworks, but there's a very small impact in practice. There's not much plantations. There's like, it exists, but it's very, very small. Um, decentralization is kind of the same. Regulatory framework have uh, increasingly allowed, like provided for um, local, like ter sorry, territorial governing bodies. So for instance, in French, it will, it will be uh, collectivité territoriale. Uh, to be able to man to have a forest as um, uh, as the state is managing forest, so it's it's a bit of a weird setup. It's not it's really uneven in practice. It's not really well applied, except for Cameroon, where communal forests are uh, plentiful. So again, that that's a bit of a trend that's uh, uneven, but it's uh, it's shared. Um, yeah, two last words. So all those countries also share um, their uh, involvement in VPA process with the European Union. Uh, it's quite a long-term process. There's no flexi license so far in all those countries. Um, there's been some signatures of the VPA. So Cameroon, for instance, has signed the agreement but has a lot of difficulty to actually implement and is far from being able to deliver flexi licenses. However, what can be said is that this process throughout those countries has increase the dialogue between stakeholders, has provided a push to clarify the legal frameworks, which sometimes were a bit contradictory or uneven, or there were gaps. And there's also a push to increase traceability and control over the flow of timber. It's not perfect, but uh, there's work on the ground to uh, increase traceability and uh, control points in the timber supply chain. And last but not least, those countries also share this specific um, concept of independent forest monitoring programs. So this is civil society involved in observing compliance with legal requirements. It's a concept that it's not militant uh, NGOs. It's like it's the idea of independent forest monitoring is really that the civil society can take the legal frameworks, go to the ground and see what's happening and where there's a a discrepancy between what the law says and what um, forest entities for, uh, entities involved in forest uh, management and logging are doing, they can raise it publicly. That's the idea of independent forest monitoring. Um, this action can be mandated by the state or not. It can also sometimes be formally included in the VPA. You have a small list here of the main uh, civil society organization involved in this kind of monitoring program. And the thing to keep in mind is that this gives a lot of information about uh, the risk of illegality, right? Because um, those, so reports published by those organizations are full of, uh, of details uh, about what's happening in the ground. So that's a really important tool for, um, for UTR operators to, to rely on and see what's, what's happening in the ground and what are the illegality that are commonly <laughs> Um, observed by the civil society. 